All right, guys, so today we're starting a new unit and we're going to introduce it with this idea of an enduring issue. You're going to hear us talk about this all year long. Why? It's important. Okay, there are important things in history that affect people that continue on to today. But it's also the theme of your essay on the regents. So by the time we get to June, you're going to be an expert at writing about enduring issues. So if you were to define enduring issue the best you can, what would you put there? Okay, a challenge or problem faced by people throughout history. Just kind of summarizing what he said, it's really good. Anyone have anything slightly different or want to add to that? Okay, right, has existed across time. We'll add that. And I'm just going to add have affected people in a number of ways. And as you'll see, sometimes these challenges or problems aren't all in the negative. Sometimes something that carries negative effects also has some positive effects, which I think we'll see as we start discussing maybe some of these ideas or technologies. So we're gonna focus on kind of like two enduring issues. So we're gonna call ideas and technologies or the impacts of those things as enduring issues. So to get to that, let's talk about some ideas that have maybe had effects on people throughout history. This is, I think, harder to brainstorm than the technologies. Can you think of an idea that may have affected people either now or in the past? Ooh, like really good. Absolutely. That's it's on my list. Idea. If you were to define democracy, what would you say about it? It doesn't have to be perfect. Like, what does this word mean? Okay, right? So, good. People have a say in the government. Yeah, guys, and this is a very general statement, and depending on the civilization, that can vary, right? The ancient Athenians, every male citizen could actually participate in lawmaking. That's not the case in the United States, right? All we could basically do as citizens is pick the people who then go make the laws. But at its very general sense, democracy, people have a say in the government. So that can have an impact, right? If you're a person who doesn't have democracy and you hear about that idea, that might motivate you to do something. That might motivate Caleb to go, I want choice. Absolutism. That's an absolutely great answer. Mm, it's an idea. True story. Okay, Catholicism is a branch of Christianity. Yes. It's your big three monotheistics, right? Okay, and if you partake in one of those religions, and there are millions of them, right? I could stand here for probably an hour and list philosophies and religions, okay? These have all impacted people over time, right? If you are a devout Christian or a Jew, you believe in the Ten Commandments, right? Maybe that guides your behavior. Hinduism, right? A belief in karma and reincarnation. Perhaps that guides your behavior in some way. So you can have a more favorable reincarnation in your next life, right? These ideas have impacted people, caused them to behave in certain ways. Maybe at some point, the leader of the religion might say, hey, go fight that war on behalf of God. This is what God wants. Trust me, right? Maybe you remember the Crusades and stuff from ninth grade, right? These things motivate people. That's the hard one. I think the inventions or technologies that have impacted people might be easier for you guys to recall. Because I would argue that most technologies have had some sort of an impact. What technologies can we name? Ooh, a cell phone, right? And I'll also add smartphone to that. I think the smartphone, which is a type of cell phone, probably has had more of an impact than my dad's old school flip phone, perhaps, which he still uses because he's a dinosaur. The light bulb and electricity, yeah. Printing press. Yeah, yeah. that's going to be a big part of our lesson for the next couple of days, believe it or not, the printing press. Give me a few more, guys. Technologies, come on. Gunpowder weapons, true. Definitely has had an impact. You've seen it firsthand, right? Allowed the Europeans to basically establish trade relationships with India and China. But what's that thing you need to make the smartphone something that you actually care about? Yeah, the internet, guys, right? I think we just forget that word at this point, right? We don't even... <laughs> We just take it for granted that this brick in our pocket does all these things. No, the internet, right? And Wi-Fi is what allows us to connect to that worldwide network of computers. So let's pick one of these things, one of these ideas or inventions, and you tell me how they may have impacted people. Let's pick an easy one, the internet. You guys tell me right now the ways in which the internet has affected people over the course of the last 30 plus years. Because really the internet came into its own with Mr. With Mr. Pandoff said America Online about 1993. So how has this changed our world? How does this impact us every single day? What does it enable us to do? Okay, instant, so here's some impacts. Instant communication and knowledge of current events. 
You used to have to read this thing that came to your house once a day called the newspaper. And by the time you read it, it was probably out of date. Things have already happened by the time you read it. Other impacts, both good and bad. Doesn't have to be all good. Ooh, interesting. Maybe has had a negative impact on in-person socialization. Maybe we're not as good about socializing in real life because all we do is do Snapchat streaks. I don't have that and I don't really know what that means, but I just hear the things that kids say. Okay, allows for social media. And I think even within that, right? Social media is a key component of the internet. I think we can examine the positive and negative effects of that. Tell me potentially a negative of social media. Ooh, interesting, good call. So maybe a negative effect equals has led to possible poor self-esteem because people just keep comparing themselves to what they see on the internet as if that was real. It's not. Very good analysis. More trade. You could buy anything in the world and have it delivered to you within days. It's mind blowing, truly. Okay, intercontinental trade uh, and communication. Easier to communicate in multiple language, languages. You guys get the idea, right? These are the impacts of technology, both good and not so good. This particular technology. Okay guys, so what we're going to do is analyze a historical event and describe basically how this event is a turning point and how some of the inventions that come out of this event have forever impacted the way people live and think about the world. Okay, it's another impact of ideas and technology situation. So if I call an event in history a turning point, remind me, what is this term turning point? Okay, moment in history has a big impact. I'll take it, right? That forever alters human history. Absolutely, the scientific revolution is such a turning point. Most usually when we say the word revolution, that's gonna be a turning point in history, right? Some kind of big, massive change. Revolution does not always have to be war. It could just be a massive shift in thinking, okay? So what I would like you guys to do is get started on this. So look at these three columns here. You got three sections. One says the before, one says the spark, and one says the after, okay? To kind of illustrate what life was like and how people thought about things both before and after the scientific revolution. So I would like you guys to look at questions one, two, and three on the left. Look at those three questions. And then you're gonna find the answers to those three questions in the reading. You do not need to use full sentences and you're gonna stop after one, two, and three. All right, guys, looks like we're about ready to chat. Before 1500, okay, I know we're going way back in the past, right? Even before 1750, which is what I said the last unit was all about, right? What did the world look like back then? But you'll see, we're quickly gonna get to the modern times, right? The modern world is helped or brought about by the, the developments that come about in this lesson. So how did people believe the solar system was structured? Some of you guys may have learned about this last year. You should have. What was the solar system like or how do we view the solar system before the year 1500? Yeah, okay, the geocentric model. All planets and the sun revolve around the earth, okay? This is what the ancient Greek astronomers came up with, which makes sense, right? Just based on pure observation, if you were to just stand on the planet and look up you see a big bright dot in the sky. The next night you see this big bright dot over here and then over here. So logic would dictate, oh, it looks like the planets are revolving around me. Okay, the sun, one day it's over here. Then the next day it's over here in the sky or something like that. Or the same thing with the moon, right? So it made sense that people assumed that just based on pure observation. But obviously we know that's not true. The, the geocentric model is the answer for number two, okay, the geocentric model of the solar system. And then Christianity, who also taught that the earth is in the center of all things, they added a little bit more to the story. What did the Christians teach about the structure of the universe? Okay, so Christianity taught that, yes, the earth is in the center of the solar system and God put it there, right? So if someone comes around and starts saying, you know what, actually the sun's in the center of the solar system, not only are you challenging traditional Greek and Roman astronomy, you're challenging the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, right? When I say the words Catholic and Christian, right? Catholicism is a branch of Christianity. There could be other types of Christians. That's the one we're primarily... Yeah, you can use them interchangeably, okay? So keep that in mind as like context, backstory, because some people, when they start to challenge these ideas, they're gonna be met with a lot of backlash, okay? Just like today, when people challenge longstanding traditions and ideas, oftentimes they're met with a lot of backlash. Okay, so let's take a look at the spark. The spark is historical circumstances. And based on what I saw in a lot of tests, 
I don't think we still quite understand what this means, and that concerns me. Can somebody remind me what I mean by the phrase historical circumstances? The things that had to happen prior, right? What led to an event? So this is what we're going to do now. We're going to build the before, right? What are the things that had to happen first for people to say, you know what? Oh, man, actually, the sun's in the center of the solar system. It's going to take, like always, technology and a little bravery, quite frankly, as you're going to see. So let's take a look at this reading. The spark, the historical circumstances. I'm going to read some of this with you guys. The Renaissance. Oh, a rebirth of learning and the arts inspired a spirit of curiosity in many fields. Scholars began to question ideas that had been accepted for hundreds of years. Meanwhile, the religious movement known as the Protestant Reformation, hopefully you learned of these two things last year, prompted followers to challenge accepted ways of thinking about religious beliefs. For example, Martin Luther criticized the Catholic Church for the sale of indulgences, which essentially allowed people to pay for having their sins forgiven. Okay, so this begins that process, right? That we're going to question what the Catholic Church is doing. Perhaps the scientists wouldn't feel like they could be free to do that if Martin Luther didn't come first. Maybe, do you guys remember like 95 theses from last year? Does that ring a bell? Right, he had a list of complaints about the church and he nailed them to a church door. According to legend, he begins that questioning process, right? So he's part of the historical circumstances for scientific challenging or ch scientific challenges. Like the artists in the Renaissance, scholars during the scientific revolution owed the foundation of their work to Greek, Roman, and Muslim scholars that came before them. So without prior learning, perhaps we can't make new observations. The ideas and techniques that enabled the start of the scientific revolution were passed around the Mediterranean world from one golden age to another. Trade between the Ottoman Empire and Europe and Byzantine scholars who left Constantinople for Italy after the Ottomans conquered it led to the rediscovery of Greek and Roman texts that had been kept in the Middle East during the chaotic European Middle Ages. Okay, so all those developments, all that knowledge that we used to have that the Europeans lost during the quote unquote dark ages found its way back. It's really hard to develop new inventions and new ideas if you don't have the opportunity to build them upon prior ideas. So having those prior ideas to build upon came back. In addition, Muslim scholars made great strides in science and their ideas were shared with Europeans and contributed to discoveries made during the scientific revolution. This was made possible with new inventions such as the printing press, which was developed by Johann Gutenberg. Books that contain scientific knowledge could now be produced quickly and inexpensively. So not only is the knowledge back, now you have new tools that make the knowledge more easily accessible. I know it doesn't seem like the same thing, but the printing press, guys, is like the Snapchat or the Twitter for the time period. It makes ideas more easily accessible. You guys with me so far? Cool. Discoveries made during the European Age of Exploration also contribute to the scientific revolution and help spread its impact. During the Renaissance, European explorers traveled to Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Let's pause for a second. Tell me why. You just learned about it. Why did the Europeans go to these places? What were they looking for? Salt, spices, right? Cotton, right? They wanted luxury goods. They wanted spices. Exactly, right? That's why they took to the seas. And you can't just do that, right? You need the technologies to do that first, right? Navigational tools. Well, navigational tools, if you think about it, could also be used to just point upwards towards the sky and make more efficient observations, okay? The age of European exploration also fueled a great deal of scientific research, especially in astronomy and mathematics. Navigators needed better instruments and geographic measurements, for example, to determine their location in the open sea. As scientists began to look more closely at the world around them, they made observations that did not match ancient beliefs. They found that they had reached a limit of, classical, of the classical world's knowledge. Okay, classical world meaning the Greeks and Romans and the, ancient, and the Chinese yet they still needed to know more. One of the things that happens is once they develop telescopes, right, to magnify things, they point to them in the sky and they said, okay, yeah, I see what you're saying, that the planets are revolving, revolving around me. Every night I look up, the bright spot is moving, but they don't move consistently. One day they move this way, the next day it's back over here. So they had to kind of resolve that. Like, it doesn't seem like there's these perfect orbits around the Earth. Maybe there's more at play here. Maybe there's more at stake. We got to figure out what's really going on. Now that we just read about it, under the spark, you're going to answer those three questions. It should be nice and easy now.
One, two, and three under the spark. Okay, guys, this should be quick and easy, right? We just did it together. So tell me some events in history that led to the scientific revolution, right? These events had to happen first before we start questioning the universe. The Renaissance, guys, the Renaissance. Renaissance gotta be there, right? The Renaissance artists and scientists are challenging things. Tell me one more. Jax. Protestant Reformation, right? When the church officials are like, yo, the Catholic Church, they might be wrong about some things. I don't really agree. Once people start getting brave and challenging traditions, that opens the door for other people to do the same thing. Age of Exploration, 100% could also go here. I know I only asked for two, but there are three possible answers here. Okay. European scientists, right? They're still emerging out of the quote-unquote dark ages. They're, they can't be automatically developing all these new technologies to discover how the world really works. You have to get some basis of knowledge first. It's like why you guys are in school right now, right? You can't go right to college. You can't go right to a crazy kind of job, right? You got to get a basic knowledge framework first. So how do the Europeans get their knowledge to build off of again? The printing press can absolutely go here, right? The printing press helps circulate ideas. Absolutely. Who brought knowledge back to Europe? Okay. Rediscovered Greek and Roman texts. Okay. And also guys too, remember the Ottoman Empire conquered Constantinople. And Constantinople, if you remember from a couple weeks ago, was the capital of the former Byzantine Empire. And if you remember your ninth grade, that was the leftovers of the Roman Empire. So all that Roman knowledge was still in Constantinople. But when the Ottomans came to town, the Europeans were like, ha ha, I gotta get the heck out of here or they're, or they're coming after me. And then where did they go? They went mostly to Italy. Okay, and they brought all that old school Roman knowledge back to Italy, start spreading around on the printing press, boom, pow, we all have a basic level of knowledge that we can now build off of. And then we're gonna take it further, right? Always taking things further, okay? The Muslims who controlled a lot of Europe during the Middle Ages, preserved a lot of that knowledge, and then gradually as Europeans start trading more, that knowledge comes back. Very good. So this kind of relates to what, what Jay Karen wrote for number three as well, or for number two rather, right, the telescope, but how does the age of exploration play a role here? Once Europeans start exploring, what did they have to do that would further technology? Exactly, need new technologies to explore the oceans, and also convinced Europeans that they didn't know everything. Help spread curiosity. Like what, it, what is out there in the world? What is there still to discover, right? As Europeans start exploring and discovering things, they're convincing themselves or they're seeing that, man, what we thought we knew is actually wrong. How can we not be wrong anymore? Right? That's like the key to this unit, guys, is this self-awareness that you don't know everything and let's investigate as much as we can to really figure out what the truth is. That's a revolutionary way of thinking. Whereas in the past, we didn't do that. We just accepted what the church and other religions told us as being true. Now, because people are opening up the floodgates to questioning that, more people are coming out and saying, maybe, maybe there's more to the story that I don't know about. I know it doesn't seem like a big deal, but that mind shift, that mindset shift is huge. So those were the historical circumstances for now the turning point. What is the scientific revolution, right? So if you look at this first paragraph here, the scientific revolution was a new way of thinking about the natural world because it was based upon careful observation and a willingness to question the accepted beliefs. I will let you, and you should, copy and paste that exact definition as your answer for number one. Please go ahead and do that right now. And when I say the natural world, guys, we're talking about what is outside. What is this force that's pulling objects to the earth? What is going on in the solar system? That's the natural world stuff, the outside world. All right, so, so far, we explored the view of the universe before 1500. We looked at and we saw how the Europeans kind of relied on traditional religious teachings to kind of conceptualize their world. And then we saw some historical circumstances that led to people perhaps questioning traditions. Okay, the printing press also furthers this, right? Because not only are people starting to question tradition, but more people are hearing about it, okay? It's one thing for one person to question something, but if no one else knows about it, it doesn't become an issue, right? So now we got to talk about the after. So once we have challenges to traditions, how do things start to change? Okay, I'm going to read this with you guys, and then I'm going to ask you to do a couple of questions, okay? 
Beginning in the mid-1500s, a few scholars published works that challenged the ideas of the ancient thinkers and the church. As these scholars replaced old assumptions with new theories, they launched a change in European thought that historians call the scientific revolution. This was a new way of thinking about the natural war because it was based upon careful observation and a willingness to question accepted beliefs. You're going to examine the world for yourself and not accept anything as the truth. You're going to discover it for yourself, if it's true or not. That's a very powerful shift in thinking. I know it doesn't sound like it is, but it is. An early challenge to accept his scientific thinking came in the field of astronomy. It started when a small group of scholars began to question the geocentric theory. Remember, geocentric is the earth in the center. Although backed by authority and common sense, right, common sense, like you look around the sky, it looks like things are moving around you. The geocentric theory did not accurately explain the movements of the sun, moon, and the planets. This problem troubled a Polish cleric and astronomer named Nicholas Copernicus. Okay, so not only was he an astronomer, he worked for the church, right? So imagine a church guy saying, you know what, I think my people I work for are wrong. You're going to be a little bit careful, right? And this guy was extremely careful. In the early 1500s, Copernicus became interested in an old Greek idea that the sun stood at the center of the universe. After studying planetary movements for more than 25 years, Copernicus reasoned, meaning used his brain instead of accepting tradition, that indeed the sun, uh, st sorry, the stars, the earth, and other planets revolved around the sun. So he came out and he said, the church is wrong. Or did he? Let's see. Copernicus's heliocentric or sun-centered theory still did not completely explain why the planets orbited the way they did. He also knew that most scholars and clergy, meaning church workers, would reject his theory because it contradicted their religious views. So let's think about that for a second. Why do you think the Roman Catholic Church would care that a bunch of people are saying that the church is wrong about something? Because I don't think kids kind of understand that. Why is it a big deal when someone challenges accepted beliefs? What is so threatening about that? Any ideas? People start questioning the church on religion. They question the church on astronomy. And the printing press is circulating these ideas to the mass public. If you're the Pope, the guy who's in charge, why are you concerned and maybe you want to put a stop to that? That's really what I'm asking you. If you were a religious person and you went to a church every day or every Sunday, whatever, and then you found out that that church is wrong about some things, if you're a rational person, would you continue going to that church? Maybe not. Maybe not. So if more and more people say, I'm not going to go to that church anymore because I know they're wrong, is the church going to be pulling as much money when that donation basket circulates towards the end? Not so much. And if there's less money coming in, can the Pope maintain his nice comfy residence hanging out in Italy? Maybe not so much. Goodbye powerful Pope, goodbye priests, goodbye all those people who depend on income for their positions. This is why they freaked out when people start to question the church. Does that make any sense? So Copernicus was not dumb, right? He knew that if he spoke out against this, he'd be in deep, as they say, doo-doo. Copernicus' heliocentric or sun-centered theory, right? So fearing ridicule or persecution, meaning bullying. Copernicus did not publish his findings until 1543, which was the last year of his life. He figured, oh, I, they can't come after me if I'm already dead. He received a copy of his book on the revolutions of the heavenly bodies on his deathbed. Imagine that, you're dying. Oh, here, your book is finally published. Here you go. Oh, they can't come after me now, which is what he wanted, right? So he had the idea and it was able to be circulated, right? When people can get, can, can get access to the idea, that's what's kind of dangerous here, all right? So he knew that that could be dangerous, so he waited to the very end. Other people would be a little more brave. An Italian scientist named Galileo Galilei, how's that for a name? built on the new theories about astronomy, right? So he built upon prior knowledge. How do you do that? You get the book. How do you have the book? The printing press, right? All these things go together. There is no Galileo unless there's a Copernicus, a, there, uh, unless there's a Copernicus. There's no Copernicus unless all these new technologies come out. As a young man, Galileo learned that a Dutch lens maker had built an instrument that could enlarge far off objects. Galileo built his own telescope, which is a lens, right? Piece of glass that lets you look far away and used it to study the heavens in 1609. Then in 1610, he published a book called Starry Messenger, which described his astonishing observations. Galileo announced that Jupiter had four moons, 
actually has, I think, 80, but he only saw four of them, the four biggest ones, and that the sun had dark spots. He also noted that the Earth's moon had a rough, uneven surface. This shattered Aristotle's theory that the moon and stars were made of pure, perfect substance, and the church also taught the same thing. Galileo's observations, as well as his laws of motion, also clearly supported the heliocentric theories of Copernicus. Galileo's findings frightened both Catholic and Protestant leaders because they went against, against church teaching and authority. If people believed the church could be wrong about this, they could question other church teachings as well, right? Goodbye priests, goodbye pope, all those jobs might get lost if no more money is coming in. In 1616, the Catholic Church warned Galileo not to defend the ideas of Copernicus. Although Galileo remained publicly silent, he continued his studies. Then he published another book, and then he, the book presented the ideas of both Copernicus and Ptolemy, which is a Greek guy who said the Earth is in the center of the solar system. But it clearly showed that Galileo supported the Copernican theory. The Pope angrily summoned Galileo to Rome to stand trial before the Inquisition. The Inquisition was this thing that went on during the Middle Ages, where the church was just routing up people that challenged it and basically executed them after finding them guilty of contradicting traditional beliefs. So they pulled Galileo in for a trial. He just had an idea published in a book and he finds himself in a court being accused of a crime. Galileo stood before the court and under the threat of torture, he knelt before the cardinals, high ranking church people, and read aloud a signed confession. In it, he agreed that the ideas of Copernicus were false. Okay, so he said, JK, LOL, I made the whole thing up under the threat of torture. The church wanted to shut him down. Okay, let's pause for there at, the, at this point and go back to the organizer. And I would like you guys to do one, two, three, and four, which go along with what we just read. You don't need full sentences. All right, guys, really quick. This should be easy. Okay, I'm not going to type these in. Make sure you're either paying attention or write them in on your own. How did, let's see, let's go back to number one here. Scientific revolution. You should have a definition there, right? It's a time period where we're challenging traditional beliefs. For number two, how is Copernicus different from traditional ideas? The old idea was the Earth is in the middle. The new idea, the sun is in the middle, right? Heliocentric model. How were the ideas of Galileo different from traditional ideas? Same thing. He also thought the sun is in the solar system. Sorry, the sun is in the center of the solar system. How did the Catholic Pope react to Galileo's ideas? put Galileo on trial, right? And th threatened him with torture until Galileo took it all back, right? The fancy word that they like to use sometimes is the word recant, R-E-C-A-N-T. Galileo recanted. It's a fancy way of saying, JK, I made the whole thing up. I'm going back on my word. Kepler's contribution, elliptical orbits, right? So an old idea was everything had a perfect circle around the sun or the earth. Kepler's like, actually, they're like elliptical meaning like squash like this, right? Not perfect circle. Some planets are closer to the sun and at some points they're close to the sun and other parts far away. So Francis Bacon, another scientific guy, says we should not accept truth if it's told to us. What did he want to do first before we could accept an idea as truth? Form a hypothesis and try to prove it, right? Design an experiment, make observations and design an experiment. Then you can prove things to be true. That's why we have the scientific method, right? Because of Francis Bacon right here. You make an observation, you form a hypothesis, and you design an, a valid experiment before you can prove something to be true. That's a, guys, I know it sounds weird, but a revolutionary change in the way people thought about things. No longer are we accepting things as truth. You prove it to be true using technology and your observations and experiments. One more person. Isaac Newton. What did he come up with? Gravity, right? He discovered the force of gravity. We'll keep it nice and simple, right? And he did so much observation and experimentation, right? He did all these drops and he kept calculating all the rates at which things fall and established all these laws about gravity, how fast things fall to the planet. And eventually he came up with a constant, said things fall at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared something you might learn about when you take physics. That becomes like a natural law. Every single time, objects fall at a specific acceleration rate. I know it sounds like science class, and it is, okay? But they used their brains to figure this out. They didn't just accept things anymore. This is how we explain why the moon doesn't just float away, right? The Earth is so big as a massive gravitational force that keeps it around us. 
and the sun is way bigger than the Earth, so the sun kind of keeps us in orbit. How, how it all got there, I couldn't tell you. 